Silicon solar panels are extraordinarily popular at the moment for domestic and commercial use, and for a good reason. Cost is decreasing and efficiency is increasing, but what, what if I were to tell you that there was a better alternative in the form of a paint? Perovskite solar paint can be used to produce panels that are flexible and thin, and they can be made in a normal factory setting, and they can also be produced, mass produced, by a printer. On the other hand, we have traditional silicon solar panels, which are relatively bulky and fragile compared to perovskites, and they're produced under very high temperatures, around 1400 degrees Celsius, and they also require a clean room setting to produce, which means we have to filter dust and other contaminants out of the air in order to produce highly efficient panels. So, how do these perovskite panels work? Well, firstly, the term perovskite actually refers to this polymorphic crystal structure, which is nicknamed ABX3. A single crystal looks something like this, although it does change with temperature. We won't go into that kind of depth yet. So we have two three-dimensional structures. A cubic structure superimposed over an octahedral structure. And you'll see on each corner of the cubic structure, to start with, we have A's. And these A's are basically placeholders our A groups of molecules, which are methyl ammonium, formamidinium, and cesium. On our octahedral structure on each vertice, we also have little X's, and those are of course placeholders for our halide atoms, which are chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And right in the middle, we have a single B atom, which in this case is lead. Now, theoretically, we can actually use a range of different chemicals. Most of the chemicals found on the periodic table, in fact, we can use in this crystal structure. For the best performance in visible light, this group of atoms and molecules are actually the most ideal. So, now that we know what perovskite actually is, we can have a look at its photovoltaic properties. And in order for it to generate any electricity, we actually have to kind of sandwich it between other materials. So I'm going to throw out a few big words here, just bear with me for a moment and hopefully I'll explain it all to you. We start off with the perovskite layer in the middle and we sandwich it between an electron transport layer and a hole transport layer. We then sandwich all those materials between another two layers, the glass and indium tin oxide layer and a metal aluminium layer. And then what happens is the sunlight actually shines through these top two layers, the indium tin oxide and the electron transport layer, and they hit the perovskite. Now this probably looks more like a Big Mac than an actual electronic circuit. So just bear with me a little bit longer and we'll get to it. So if we turn this structure on its side, we can actually use it to visualize different energy levels present in different layers of the material. We'll start off on the far side over here and we see the metal layer actually has a relatively high energy level. So it's relatively high up here. And what you have to know about electrons is they're actually quite lazy. So if there's another uh, energy level available to them that they can go to, there's a space available to them in a lower energy level, they'll actually jump down to that energy level. So we'll see next door to the metal layer, we actually have the whole transport layer and it has a slightly lower energy level. So if there's a space available there for an electron, it'll jump down from the metal layer into the whole transport layer and it won't go back up. So now that it's in the whole transport layer, you can see the perovskite layer next door has an even lower energy level. So if, again, there's a space available there, it'll jump down into that layer again. But now that the electrons in the perovskite layer, you see there aren't any more, there aren't any lower energy levels in any of the neighboring layers. So what happens is the electrons basically stuck down in that perovskite layer, back down in the end junction, the negatively charged junction of the perovskite until the sunlight that we mentioned earlier shines through the indium tin oxide and the electron transport layer to hit the perovskite. And what happens is the photons present in sunlight actually give their energy to the electron here in the end junction and they give it a boost like an elevator. They elevate this energized electron up to a higher energy level in the p-junction. And once it's up there, you can see next door, it actually has lower energy levels available to it. So it can start moving down the steps again. So once again, it moves down into the electron transport layer, if there's a spot available. And then again, in the indium tin oxide layer, there's a lower energy level. And if there's a space, it'll jump back down there. And then in a regular solar panel, where there's multiple cells stuck side by side to each other, you actually have these panels joined end to end. So this indium tin oxide layer would actually be connected to the metal layer of a neighboring cell. So it will continue that process all over again until it eventually gets out of the panel, and that's how it generates electricity. 
Remember when I said that perovskite can be made of virtually any material on the periodic table? Well, let's talk about that right now. Let's go back to our crystal structure back here and consider what's going to happen if we start putting different chemicals, different atoms in this structure. And what's basically going to happen is the whole thing is either going to increase or decrease in volume, right? It's going to change in size, the crystal. It's going to get bigger or smaller. And what that does is it actually changes the electronic properties of the crystal itself. So there's a greater distance for electrons to move around in this crystal space. And that translates to, back over here, our electronic diagram, the distance that an electron has to travel to go from a ground state to an excited state in the perovskite actually grows and shrinks. And what that then translates to is the size of the energy requirements of the perovskite here gets bigger or smaller depending on the chemicals that we use. And this resulting change in energy means that we can use different wavelengths of light because these different wavelengths of light have different levels of energy. So we can really tune our perovskite to react to different wavelengths of light using different chemicals, which is a pretty amazing property. All right, so now that you know how a perovskite solar panel works in a very general way, we can talk about how the special ink or paint has been made. Firstly, the surface itself is made up of the two layers that I've mentioned before. So we have to have the glass indium tin oxide and the electron transport layer made up already. And then what we do is to make the ink, we have to mix up a very large quantity of different chemicals. So cesium iodide, formium iodide, methyl ammonium chloride, methyl ammonium bromide, and lead bromide. We mix them all up in a big beaker full of ink. And then we spray it on to those first two layers we've mentioned before. And what happens once we spray it onto these two layers is the crystals start to form. These bonds are broken, individual bonds are broken, and the crystal structure starts to form. But the thing is, it's quite slow to actually form that crystal structure. So what we do is we actually dip it in a little bit of ether. And what ether does is it actually speeds up this crystallization process. So we get crystals forming on these plates a lot quicker than normal. And then when we have enough crystals that are formed, we heat it up to remove the ether. Once we've dried off the ether using heat, we need to also form the whole transport layer and the metal layer. And to produce the whole transport layer, we need to mix together these three very complex organometallic compounds. And we don't really know, need to go into detail with those. All you really need to know is they're very good at their job. They're very good at working in the whole transport layer. And what we do is, once we mix them together, we actually drip a little bit onto these panels and we spin it around at around 3000 RPM to produce a nice even coat on the surface of the panel. Once we've produced our whole transport layer, we also need to produce our final form of metal. And to do that, we need to heat metal up to a very high temperature in a vacuum. And what that does is it unsticks metal atoms from the bulk metal source that we have and it sticks them onto the top of this panel. And that gives us a complete perovskite cell. Now, although we can't actually paint the stuff directly onto a house, the solar panels we can produce using these methods can actually be produced in huge numbers. And the panels produced are way thinner and way more flexible than conventional silicon panels. We can also slap them onto any relatively smooth surface, like sheds or cars. All right, so this paint still needs to be applied to a proper substrate. You can't just put it straight onto your house just yet. But the use of this paint heralds a new, cheaper and eventually more efficient method of making solar panels that are extremely flexible and robust, and that can be attached to any section of the house. Alright, thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below. And make sure to like and subscribe, it really means a lot.